Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you this afternoon to the Institute of Criminology and Faculty of Law. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you are here this afternoon. Um, I have the privilege of leading uh, researchers in the Institute of Criminology at the moment um, who carry the torch for probation and community uh, penalties. But as many of you will know, the Institute has long had interests in these matters, first through Joan King, partly through Tony Bottoms also, and then, of course, through Bill McWilliams himself, in whose honour this series of uh, lectures is held. I shall introduce our speaker uh, in, in a moment, but first let me just say that Bill McWilliams' interest in, in punishment in the community was both lively and at times controversial. And as we know, he was a staunch advocate of the need for rigorous evaluation of probation practice, but an equally staunch critic of the excesses of the management ideal. And he would have much to say about current developments, I'm sure. Is the probation service to die? Was a question asked in an article in probation published by NAPO, the National Association of Probation Officers, in 1968. <laughs> a different era, a different context. It was a question asked when the Scottish Probation Service shifted probation practice to social work. Which leads me to say that the Institute is very proud to announce that it now houses the NAPO archives and indeed some archives from probation trusts. A small uh, exhibition, small collection of, of materials were on display at lunchtime, and I hope that you managed to look at some of them. In due course, we will have, uh, we will have new and bigger displays of materials uh, in the Institute Library. NAPO are fully involved in the NAPO collection in the Institute Library, and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future, and we hope that's a long time. Our enthusiasm for the task of storing probation archives, collecting them, becoming a national repository, if you like, is a measure of our interest in and of the value we place on the records of probation policy and practice. And I think, in a way, we see this as but a small contribution to the spirit of probation Perhaps it's a very important um, contribution, though, in such a sea of change. So let me turn to our speaker, our distinguished speaker. Paul has had a very long and distinguished career in probation practice and probation studies. And having mentioned NAPO, I think Paul has been a long-standing critical friend of NAPO, a very important friend, too. In 2002, having developed uh, a robust criminology and community justice presence within Sheffield Hallam University, Paul started the Hallam Centre for Community Justice, a research centre specialising in offender management, resettlement and restorative justice, where he's now a director. Paul's been very innovative. He launched a community justice portal which then, in conjunction with De Montfort University, led to the creation of the British Journal of Community Justice. And I think it's a journal which you continue to co-edit. So I think, in, in sum, Paul's career has been linked to policy, practice, and research in and around probation and with probation partners in criminal justice, and he's written on many aspects of probation practice and community justice. Two books include Understanding Modernization in Criminal Justice and Moments in Probation. So I think you've had some 38 years of work in this, this area, and Paul, it is indeed an honour that you have agreed to give this lecture. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lorraine. Can I check that everybody can hear me at the back? Yep, lovely. Um, reminds me a little bit of uh, the feelings I had when I uh, first gave a big speech at uh, a NAPO conference uh, about 33 years ago when uh, uh, I was full of the same slight trepidation. Uh, I was speaking then on withdrawal of probation officers uh, from prison, and now we're speaking about the withdrawal of probation officers for most things to do with the criminal justice system. So we've not come a long way in those 33 uh, years. I'm very honoured to be given this opportunity to do the 16th uh, Bill McWilliams uh, lecture, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about my connection to, to Bill uh, in a few minutes. Um, the one thing you can say about probation with absolute certainty is that change is a constancy in the probation service. You could pick up a quote from anywhere. I picked this one up. Even a cursory glance at the recent literature of the probation service suggests that change of a fairly substantial order has always been a dominating feature of its existence. Who said that? Well, it was Bill McWilliams in 1981. Uh, and since then, um, change has uh, been uh, and still remains a feature of the way in which we practice. We no longer can look at probation service as simply an organisation that's here to advise, assist and befriend. In some respects, it's now badged as enforcement, rehabilitation and public protection. It's a long way from advise, assist and befriend. The title of my uh, lecture was deliberately chosen. We have been here before. We've worried about the end of probation on many occasions, maybe too many times. Maybe we've quite cried wolf on occasion. Is this fundamentally different? Are we facing something which is fundamentally uh, going to destroy the probation service as we know it. And if it is different now, in what ways is it different? I'll explore a little bit about that. I put in my title, Is the Probation Service Much Cherished? I put this in because um, that's what I believe, and I'll say a little bit why I believe that in a minute. But interestingly, this title has been challenged in a number of arenas, including the MOJ, who wanted to get me to change it, um, but were relieved to let me go ahead when they saw the question mark at the end. Um, but uh, George Mayer, in his inaugural lecture at uh, Liverpool Hope University, actually questioned with me the notion of, is it much cherished? His lecture, which you can see on the YouTube, rather paints a, a dimmer picture uh, of probation. I will say why I think uh, it is much cherished. I think I'm speaking to an audience that will agree with me in large part. Does the retention of a national probation service challenge the notion that probation uh, is disappearing? Are we really uh, just um, playing around and the probation service will continue? In what other ways might the institution of probation be preserved? And that will be, in the essence, where I'm taking this lecture. I want to look at what is the institution of probation, how it's grown up, how it functions, and how uh, it can be preserved and in what ways. Does it matter and to whom? Well, I'll leave that question for discussion at the end. I think it matters. I dare say quite a few people in this audience think it matters. For some out there, it doesn't appear to, to matter. And of course, I'll try and answer the question I pose in my title, is this probation's uh, death now? Lorraine beat me to it when she quoted from the 1968 uh, uh, probation uh, journal, uh, is the probation service to die? Which, of course, in Scotland it actually did shortly afterwards. But we've heard those remarks many times. In 1974, we talked about the death knell of rehabilitation sounded by Robert Martinson's Nothing Works essay. I started work in probation in 1975, and the very first NAPO newsletter I received had the title, The Death of the Rehabilitative Ideal. 
I didn't think I'd be in a job for long. However, we seem to recover from those down days in the 70s and through the 80s. I picked up this from 1992 from Pro, the NAPO Action Members um, magazine. This is from the editorial. The move to the operation of a punitive service in the community marks the death of the traditional humane helping and caring probation service, which was one of the country's greatest contributions to civilised penological thinking throughout the world. And just in February of this year, Mike Teague said, after 105 years of world-class rehabilitative intervention, the probation service in England and Wales is about to be effectively dismantled. May not quite amount to probation's death now, but it will be a qualitatively different service. When I first started in probation, I needed concepts and ideas to revolve around to help me make sense of the world I found myself in. And it was through meeting people like Bill and others that I came with concepts of reflective practice and this notion of a constructively critical culture. Bill, as research officer in South Yorkshire Probation, promoted this uh, intensely. He said, the objective is to create an organisational culture in which the official goals and the operational goals become one. This is far from easy, but is most likely to be achieved in a culture which places high emphasis on healthy and constructive criticism. Bill, of course, had a very unique way of having constructive criticism, uh, and it composed a number of particular processes. The first one for me was to get an invite to Bill's home for what he called a soiree. I arrived not quite sure why I'd been invited. I was not uh, of the same uh, thinking as Bill. I was seen as a, somebody from a different kind of intellectual thought, but nevertheless, Bill invited me to his home. He then gave me a hot chili, home cooked, of course, with big chunks of homemade bread. This was liberally followed by home brewed beer, a very heady concoction, I seem to remember. These two got the uh, discussions flowing, but he put together a completely random group of people. Bill was not somebody who would talk to people who agreed with him. He would set himself out to find others who disagreed with him. And I was there because he regarded me as the red under the bed in Doncaster. Um, I was someone that was coming from a very different intellectual tradition. So I was there to try and defend what the difference of a radical position was uh, to this. Of course, I lived out of Sheffield. I lived in Doncaster, as I still do. And so therefore, after the home room beer, uh, it was necessary uh, to go to bed. You might think that was the end of the evening, but not so. You then tried to sleep to the tap, tap, tap of a typewriter. I didn't know the first time what was happening, but this went on seemingly for hours. Eventually, you woke and you had a nice hot breakfast. At breakfast, you didn't relax, get your bearings for the day. Bill shoved a paper into your breakfast table and said, these are the ideas I've come up with from our discussions last night. What do you think? You earned your breakfast. That was the constructively critical culture that Bill tried to engender in his own work and in others. And I think we've seen that being part and parcel of what probation is about uh, right through to this day. I took three random quotes from the 15 previous lectures that give some indication of that. Peter Rayner in 2012 talked about uh, uh, what works being fed by a culture of curiosity. Bowie in 2006 talked about be having a more holistic understanding of the moral complexities of criminal justice. And last year, Steve Pollock said, if probation is a morally significant activity, not simply reducible to the techniques of correction, it requires a competent, critical, and reflective workforce. These notions are inherent to the way that probation is as an institution. It is reflective, it is critical, it is innovative, it is constructively so. It breeds on research, on evaluation, on personal engagement. And it's those characteristics that have carried it forward in the past 105 years, and I hope for a while to come. <laughs>
I want to apply that constructive critical analysis to what I'm going to go on to do. The question at the beginning of the title is quite important because I don't yet know, I may know by the end of the lecture, whether indeed this is probation's death knell or not. Uh, sometimes when I've been reading stuff, I've felt there's very little hope. At other times, I think there are some straws in the wind. So I want to keep that question floating during the session. I'm going to talk in three phases. The first is to try and understand and triangulate what I call the institution of probation. What is it? I think it's a combination of ideas, policy, and organisational uh, arrangements. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in the first ten minutes or so. I then want to talk a little bit about transforming revolution. This, this lecture is not essentially about that, but I think uh, I need to say some comments about it um, uh, and uh, where probation might or might stand, not stand in that. The final part assumes that transforming revolution will take place. And if it does, I want to ask the question, where will probation rest under those new arrangements? Is there a role for the institution of probation under the new arrangements? <coughs> I've forgotten that was there. Um, but just before I move on, I just wanted to um, say something. I was at a, uh, a, a concert recently when a magician came on stage. I was with Philip Proctor, who some of you will know from uh, probation service. And this magician asked for a volunteer from the audience um, uh, to come on stage and help him with his magic act. And foolishly, uh, I agreed. Um, whilst I was on stage, um, Philip drew a cartoon of what happened. Um, and it was interesting because I'd always believed this, but I didn't actually realise it until it happened. The magic trick was to cut me in half. And as he cut me in half, that's what it revealed. <laughs> and I think that that's important. Although I am trying to be objective and led by the evidence before me, I am motivated by a commitment to the probation service that I've carried all my professional life. And I'm sure many others here, if cut in half, would similarly uh, find that they have probation written through them. So probation, big ideas and policy. Bill McWilliams and Ken P said way back in 1990, does probation need a transcendent justification for its activities? <coughs> Indeed, the famous quartet of articles by Bill explored the changing relationships between probation policy, practice and big ideas. Bill focused on eras where the oneness of the probation officer and the probation service in terms of policy and practice gave it internal and external coherence. The probation officer was the probation service and the probation service was the probation officer. Therefore, you could read off what it was about uh, comfortably. By the time he wrote his last piece, Probation pragmatism and policy in 1987, Bill began to tease out what became the beginning of changes which are still reverberating today and important when we try and understand what the institution of probation is. Bill identified three elements in constructing the probation world or institution in the late 1970s. The impact of ideas was continuing on probation practice though they were now more varied than they had been in the earlier eras. Policy was emerging as an independent variable on probation practice. And in particular, we began to talk about alternatives to custody as an overarching policy objective. And the organisational arrangements within which probation took place uh, varied over time, was moving and changing. It is these three elements the combination of ideas, policy, and organisational arrangements which characterises what I call the institution of probation. That was a diagram that Bill used in that final paper to illustri illustrate the change in dimensions of probation uh, in, uh, the 19th and, uh, in the 20th century up to the end of the 1970s. And what we see in his third era, what he called pragmatism, was the breaking down of big ideas. Um, indeed, ideas in conflicts with each other, 
he identified managerialism in its early days, the radical school and personalist approach, which was uh, the one that he championed. I took those ideas and moved them forward and very briefly want to share that with you. So that in the 1980s, one had extremely youthful probation officers, an example of 1980s. I know it's hard to believe that all those years have passed. Um, and try to look at each of these eras in relation to policy, organisation and big ideas. In the 1980s, alternatives to custody were still uh, a policy objective. But for the first time, we see policy objectives being imposed on probation. And this was most clearly exemplified in SNOP, the Statement of National Objectives and uh, Priorities, which came in in 1984. It's interesting, though, that in South Yorkshire probation, the constructively critical culture that Bill had created made us sit down and look at this paper, which was called uh, Aims, Objectives and Priorities, and made the chief change that to Aims, Tasks and Resources. So South Yorkshire would not go with the notion that there had to be priorities in practice. That would not happen today. Uh, and as, of course, uh, the 1980s moved on, SNOP and SLOPs and TOPs uh, became uh, the order of things. And if you weren't Gilpin Blacked uh, and uh, understood management by objectives, then you didn't know where probation uh, was in those days. The outside was imposing its policy on probation. It was no longer... Uh, simply able to decide for itself. On top of all that, on a political level, we saw the law and order ideology of Thatcher and the development of the early days of new public management and her notion of value for money. The organisation began to change. Bill had identified the increasing role of management against the professional autonomy, so loved of probation officers, but it's a long time since we've experienced that. Within probation, grade and role diversification gathered pace. Probation officers from being 95% of the service were down and now are around 50% uh, of the probation service. Who did what changed and was up for grabs? And the big debate in NAPO was about the boundaries between roles. What did so-called probation ancillaries, regarded as a term of insult in those days, do and what did probation officers do? Lots of uncertainty about who led on probation practice. The big ideas that were around were diversification and what I've chosen to call eclecticism. Anything went in the 1980s. I started as a training officer uh, in 1982 and I would be rung up and, and asked, could I put on a course on uh, Heimler social functioning? Could I put a course on, on behaviour modification? Could I do a group work course? And of course, in those days, we said yes. So even if only four people came, we did a Heimler social functioning course. I still don't know what it's about. Um, <laughs> but a great guy from Manchester who was apparently accredited came across to do that course for us. There was lots of versions of the big ideas. And I and Peter Rayner wrote different versions of how that broke down in relation to practice. From Marxism to correctionalism, fire of course, the famous non-treatment paradigm of Bottoms and McWilliams. When we moved into the 1990s, we went into an era where there was something of the night about it. <laughs> this was a difficult era for probation. Punishment in the community was the policy idea, and that was not at all wanted by the probation service. Public protection and just deserts uh, were the predominant policy steers. But probation was to move centre stage, something we didn't grasp wholeheartedly and wanted to shy away from, but certainly was offered for an extremely brief period of time. Law and order continued to motivate political decision-making, and of course Michael Howes famously came up with his 27 points for why prison worked. What we saw in the organisation of probation was a reducing level of discretion. If we thought the 1980s had seen that, the 1990s saw it advance at a pace. National standards came in in 1992. At first, a very worry, woolly educational document. That was partly because NAPO and other organisations were involved in making it. We didn't want 
to tie ourselves down. But later versions, 95 and 2000 and so on, became ever more prescriptive about what practice should be about, to the point at which it became very difficult for a probation worker to do anything uh, when he got in in the morning without consulting the national standards to see if he could sit at his desk and could answer his phone, how many times he had to see somebody, what he should say to them, and so on and so forth. Audit and monitoring also began to be the norm. 1989 saw the Audit Commission emerge as a body that was going to look over value for money in probation. And of course we saw in 1996 the ending of social work training. And this was, uh, if anything, an important point in the history of probation, which I could discuss at length on another occasion. I think it was more symbolic in terms of what that meant about the independence of probation uh, officers rather than in itself being a problem. Because the curriculum of the new probation award was actually very similar to the curriculum of the old social work awards. So I don't think the content of training changed, but the image certainly took a dip. And of course, corrections was the philosophy that was gaining ground in the 1990s. Probation was more about gatekeeping and intermediate sanctions. There was some bottom-up what works. And this is very important because that was lost at the turn of the century as it was taken over by the establishment. Risk assessment and management became the tool by which probation managed their practice. The institution was beginning to shape. At the millennium, I think we could see a good version of the future, what I'm going to choose to call community justice. Community justice was a potential modern rallying call for the future of the probation service. Although the modernisation agenda uh, was introducing managerialism at a pace and marketisation of some services, and risk and public protection was still being uh, pushed by a Blairite government, at the same time, the Social Exclusion Unit was offering an alternative vision of what practice should be about and offered uh, pathways uh, to change which were taken up enthusiastically within the probation service. For the probation officer and worker, multiple accountabilities got in the way of their work. National standards uh, were, in one sense, on the, uh, the centre, but central control both regional and local accountability made it very difficult to know who you should listen to in developing your practice and approach. I remember particularly one example of this, the Street Crime Initiative, which Tony Blair introduced from the centre. This stood against all the local developments around resettlement and local practice. Everything had to stop and change to account for that national agenda. Probation officers and probation workers didn't know who they were accountable to. The service uh, introduced training, the uh, Diploma in Probation Studies, which again had multiple accountabilities. The student was both student, trainee and employee at the same time, a difficult and demanding role, although it was described as the Rolls Royce of training. The big idea was really community justice. Resettlement pathways were enthusiastically developed Community safety partnerships are coming in 1997, and although probation status in relation to them remained uncertain, it was a way of moving forward in developing partnerships and integration. Restorative justice uh, almost did its uh, once a decade return to centre stage. Uh, it's now back uh, coming to centre stage again. Uh, someone one day will write the policy history of restorative justice, because it had been very popular in 1985 some people will recall, although NAPO's uh, policy document against it did rather help uh, to take it out at that point. Victim focus certainly came in those days and stayed in the probation service. And community engagement uh, was still a hope uh, in some of our practice. Many of the speakers in the Bill McWilliams lecture at the turn of the century talked about these themes, none more so, more so than John Hardy, um, who talked about this vision for community justice. This looked like a positive uh, vision. We developed the British Journal of Community Justice to speak to this vision. We're still going 10 years later, but I'm not sure the vision is going. Indeed, it was only in the following year and in the rest of the first decade of the 
2000 that we see quite a sea change in the institution of probation. Modernisation accompanied by penal populism. Reducing reoffending becomes the policy aim, but North American style. Tough on crime uh, became the yardstick by which we should be just. And the word contestability reared its somewhat ugly head. It was just another name for competition. But it was certainly to be decisive in the way probation went forward. Probation was no longer the sole provider of services. A mixed economy of provision was developing. Partnerships, the voluntary sector, probation as broker. Performance indicators and targets and standardisation were all over the work that we did. Amongst this, they tried to change the organisational structure. And I remember coming here, I think, to see Judy McKnight do the 2000, I can't remember which year it was, uh, 2007, I think, um, Bill McWilliams' lecture, in which she showed us about nine different organograms as she tried to make sense of the structure of probation as it changed from the National Probation Service to NOMS and finally to the probation trusts. And psychology became the big idea once again as it had been in the mid part of the 20th century <coughs> rather differently uh, this time. Cognitive behavioural therapies predominated and the role of the accreditation uh, panel became crucial in deciding what activities probation officers were engaged in. OASIS as a tool for risk assessment uh, became absolutely central. And risks, needs and responsivity came off the tongue of all probation practitioners. There was lots of work going on in pathways with the community safety partnership, but it was difficult to keep pace with the change of direction towards programmes. And Mike Nellis talked engagingly in the Bill McWilliams lecture about the growth of techno <coughs> corrections too. So we come to the present institutional setup uh, for probation. Which way will it go? We're at a crossroads, I think, again. This time, I think, the big policy idea is clearly market economics. We can't get away from that. That's what this is all about. Um, and that's what governs the way in which the proposals are coming out. It means privatisation because the private sector is seen as a sector that can deliver uh, in a more cost-effective way. It means austerity because the government uh, has an austerity policy package. It also means process innovation. It means changing the way in which these services are delivered. And we're no longer going to have a probation service. The organisation of probation service as an institution seems to be going to be disappearing. What we're going to have are contract package providers in contract package areas. Uh, and this is quite interesting. This is going to be outsourced in 21 chunks. You may wonder why I use the word chunks. I thought could have used coterminous with PCCs, but they aren't. I could have used coterminous with police, but they aren't. I could have used coterminous with local authorities, but they aren't. They simply aren't coterminous. They are 21 chunks picked out uh, with scarcely a lot of thoughts, the existing arrangements in those areas. And clearly driven with a greater involvement for sub-partners, particularly the voluntary sector, payment by results, which I'll return to, a much reduced role for probation. I have to say, in concluding this look at the ways in which the institution of probation has changed, is that at the same time that these organisational and policy changes are afflicting the probation service, we have, I think, for the first time in a long time, a developing coherence about what good practice is about. It seems strange that we can't bring the three elements more closely together. I put desistance as the key idea, but there are many things around that uh, which we are familiar with, and I'm not going to talk about this in, uh, in detail. The Offender Engagement Programme has been interest, interesting in bringing probation workers back into good case management practice. Integrated offender management has and is being a success built on cooperation, pooling of resources and partnerships. And notions of justice reinvestment have been particularly successful in one or two parts of the country. At a time when I think we know more about what we want to do, it does seem strange 
uh, that we can't find an organisational structure to support that. So to my second part, transforming rehabilitation. I want to talk briefly about the historical backdrop. I want to reject the polarisation between private bad and public good, or public good and private... No, it's the same thing. Private good and public bad. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the role of the voluntary sector. I want to talk about probation's own role in its own downfall. And I want to talk about whether transforming rehabilitation means the dismantling of this institution of probation. Brief historical picture. I looked at over 40 nation states across the world. Some probation services started as private institutions. I looked carefully at this. This actually meant volunteers and charitable organisations. As services that developed in the 20th century, they became professionalised, government-funded and government governmental executive bodies. Newer probation services, particularly in Eastern Europe, have state-driven services. The literature talks of private organisations, but actually this is about foundations or non-governmental organisations, not private for profit. There are multiple state formations of probation, but they are all, in all 40 nation states, state-driven. <coughs> I want to reject the polarisation that's been going on between the private and the public sector. I want to start by saying there are no examples globally of private for profit organisations running probation. And that's why I think uh, this um, polarisation has grew up. There are some specialist services in the USA and of course in the techno corrections area around electronic tagging and so on there are private sector driven processes. Global organisations that we've come to love to hate, G4S, Circo, Sodexo, if you go on Twitter, they're being attacked most of every day, have a justice section that runs all sorts of things, from prisons and maybe through to legal aid soon. They also have health care and education. But they are for-profit organisations with diverse portfolios designed at the end of the day to provide dividends for shareholders. Now, the research is mixed about performance, benefits, and disbenefits. But it is hard to say that the private sector, in the work that it's done hitherto, particularly in prisons, has not had some success. The own research that I've been involved in, the research done here at Cambridge, shows that you cannot always distinguish between good quality practice between the private and the public sector. We can't wish away the private sector. It's almost too late to do that, about 25 years too late to do that. And indeed, some of the work that goes on uh, uh, can be groundbreaking and innovative. Some of it is problematic, but so is the public sector, and we sometimes forget that, I think. I think the private sector that we're dealing with understands the values of the sector, but it's not their prime driver, and that might be a particular issue. I think also the campaigns that have gone against their efficacy are limited and doomed to failure. I want to give an example of this by going back to the early days of electronic monitoring. Electronic monitoring was attacked by the public sector organisations on the grounds that it would not work. Uh, lots of campaigning going on, talking about people turning over in their beds, blocking off the signal and having the uh, a monitoring agency charge into their house as if they'd been on the loose on the streets. And the argument was that the technology would not be up to it. This was always a flawed strategy, because eventually the technology gets it right. And I think we're in danger of doing the same thing now. There are bad practices uh, in the private sector, but there are some very good practices. And we cannot just hone in on the bad practice of one sector when there have been problems in all the sectors over the past 10, 15 years. I think it's a limited approach, and I don't think it's very helpful. We might not want the private sector to run probation, but they may already have a role to play. I want to come back to this last point at the end. And do we know whether the ones that we are most familiar with will actually be the key bidders for new work? The role of the voluntary and community sector. We see voluntarism in many present-day global probation services. Voluntary sector organisations, the use of volunteers as lay supervisors, 
And of course, the use of volunteers as mentors and peer mentors and so on. But there's no example of where the state does not have a controlling stake in the delivery of statutory services. The benefits of the voluntary sector is as an adjunct, supplemental, or additional services, which is strong when it's localised and community-driven. All the research points to the benefits of the voluntary sector in this area. In the UK, I think there's been a real sense of mission drift amongst the voluntary sector, particularly amongst the larger voluntary sector players, which compromise their core values, which distinguish them from the statutory sector. Are there going to be a real influence in the course of the next 18 months? Or are they merely going to be bid candy for the private sector? I also want to make a brief point about innovation. Contrary to what is continually asserted, innovation is not the preserve of the voluntary sector, nor only possible in a competitive environment. Incentivization is not only a quality associated with cash reward. We've seen plenty of examples in the research that we've done, particularly even around payment by results, where probation and other staff are incentivized by doing a good job, by reducing reoffending, by helping uh, offenders into better situations. Cash reward does not enter into that a lot of the time. I am not starry-eyed, though, about the probation service. And if we have to look at the mess we're in now, we have to look at our own place in that. Pease, Ken Pease asked in 1999 in the first of these lectures, how well has it justified its claim that it's an efficient means of processing offenders? There is a history of inconsistent management and autonomous practices. We've lost sight of the community context, which John Crawforth talked about in his lecture in 2011. We no longer see home visiting as key to the way in which we do the work. Community engagement is um, merely a word used rather than something actively engaged with. The short-lived era of the National Probation Service greatly diminished its standing in the UK. Loss of leadership, half the chiefs of probation retired uh, in 2001, and poor leadership in the early days of the National Probation Service. Crawford talked in 2011 of a culture of learnt dependency. And also we saw the unintended consequences where big ideas become to dominate. The fate of what worth was an organisational mistake, whatever the merits of the evidence base promoting it. In the NOMS world, we were outmaneuvered by prison leaders. NAPO was a lone voice in those early years because ACOP decided uh, to put itself out of existence. When the PCA came in in 2011, the voice uh, did improve and they've done uh, a good job at putting probation uh, before the public. So to transforming rehabilitation itself and the dismantling of the institution of probation. Most of the prescriptions for change in transforming rehabilitation, probation would and have endorsed. However, nearly all the proposed mechanisms are not backed by evidence. We do not have a situation in which change is governed by what we might call evidence-informed practice. Sometimes people call that evidence-based practice. I think it's much more policy-based evidence. I want to give you three brief examples of this. We're about to see the creation of four new what work centres promoted by government. These are to be modelled on the NICE model for medical research. And there's to be one in crime reduction centred at the College of Policing. This tends to show that the government is committed to evidence-based policy. It's very interesting, though, if the model was to be followed, why it is that so much of the evidence presented in the return on transforming rehabilitation has been totally ignored. The evidence base is extremely strong about the problems involved in some of the changes. Let's take payment by results as an example. Payment by results is unproven as a mechanism to improve practice. Even the results of the first and only major violence in criminal justice in Peterborough and Doncaster that recently came out were not wholly positive about the changes that have occurred. But nevertheless, Chris Graymin said, I'm a reformer. 
I don't need to wait for more research. I'm going to implement it anyway. This is very interesting. Had he worked for NICE, and NICE come along with a new cancer drug that had a few side effects, but they thought it's actually making people better, it's having a few problems. Let's not wait for further tests. Let's not wait for further evidence. Let's just impose it on anybody. Of course not. NICE would not uh, approve such a thing. So we can't be committed to what works uh, and then actually not wait for the results of their own pilots to see how they're working out. And the third example would be community payback in London. All the rumours emerging from that experiment, and that's what it is, it's a small experiment of what's to come, suggests there are problems in implementation, suggests that practice has not gone according to how it should have done. This should and must have been evaluated to look at how it works. This would have given us some real evidence of whether these changes were based on good policies. But no, we're moving ahead on a national model. We know, and uh, Bowie talked about this in 2006, that speed always undermines implementation. He talked about it in relation to what works at the turn of the century, the ridiculous speed at which we're expected to put people on programmes, 60,000 I seem to remember, actually got in the way of that experiment being a success. The speed that we're talking about now is extremely risky. People will have seen the paper today. This would have been in my speech had I read the paper this morning. But let me just read one bit. This is a risk register leaked to The Guardian. There is more than 80% risk that an unacceptable drop in operational performance will lead to delivery failure and reputation damage. The report says the failures could be caused by industrial action, failing staff morale, staff departures of probation leaders, disengaging from the work. There is a huge risk, and that article is worth reading. The three key elements that Grayling talks about are reducing reoffending, saving money, and innovation. But actually, this is all about money and the marketization of public services, treating offenders as commodities. This is not about reducing reoffending. There are other ways you can achieve that. For heaven's sake, the probation service over the last decade has reduced reoffending by 10%. This can't be about reducing reoffending. And it can't be about innovation because there's plenty of examples of innovation around in the system at the moment. Those are nice aerosol words that we can spray on when it's all actually about saving money. George Mayer said in his inaugural lecture, fragmentation, loss of expertise, conflicts of interest, inconsistency of practice, the gains of the last decade will all be negated by these changes. The institution of probation, as I've tried to demonstrate, has been here for a long time. Their social structures have gained a high degree of resilience. They're composed of cultural, cognitive, normative and regulative elements that together with associated activities and resources provide stability and meaning to social life. They change. They adapt, they move on, that's absolutely the case. Um, but they are important as a stable force in delivering practice. Peter Rayner, though, warned us in 2012, institutions and their purposes cannot be infinitely elastic. If change is unlimited, there comes a point where it no longer makes sense to regard them as the same entity. He believes there are essential and contingent characteristics associated with what probation is about, and he itemises them there. One of the best books that I've read in probation recently is Doing Probation Work by Rob Morby and Anne Worrell, which interviewed 60 former practitioners uh, and current practitioners in the service. It's a statement about what probation is about and illustrates the complexity and the nuances that make probation such a difficult agency to describe to those that don't know it. She talks about the square of probation. It, I can only talk about it briefly. She recognises that probation is what she calls dirty work, a socially tainted occupation working with undeserving groups. She recognises that probation has always worked in turbulent conditions, and we've seen those in the first part of my lecture, threatening constantly the domain of probation. She talks about the occupational identities and cultures that have developed to deal with some of those changes. 
And finally, she talks about individual probation worker responses. Some exit, some use their voice, many are loyal. And she talks about edge work, about moving around on the edge of good practice when you're not happy with how things are going to create positive change. In her book, she identifies three distinguishing people, sets of people, ideal types. One she calls lifers, one she calls second career careerists, and the third offender managers. And she says that actually, if you pull together the best characteristics from each of those three sets of people, actually you get a ideal probation uh, worker and probably someone fit to deal uh, with the present circumstances. So she talks about the idealism, vocationalism and intellectualism of the lifer. The life experiences, transferable skills and commitment to making a difference of the second careerist. <coughs> the victim empathy, concern for public protection and willingness to challenge offending behaviour of the offender manager. It is a combination of those elements which actually makes probation such an effective institution today. It's difficult to describe in a soundbite, but probation as an institution is complex, and she demonstrates that uh, with Rob in this excellent book, which, you, uh, which I would certainly recommend to you. So the arguments for the retention of the institution of probation. No example exists of probation being organized in the manner which is being suggested throughout the world. It has been hugely successful, particularly in the last decade, in terms of external kite marks, in terms of reductions in reoffending, and in terms of worker satisfaction. I haven't talked about this much today because I'm almost taking it as read, but practice capability with regards to rehabilitation has never been so extensive and evidence-informed as it is today. Probation often acts as the social glue for commissioning and avoids arbitrary patchwork of provision, creating fragmentation, loss of continuity of care, which must ultimately heighten risk and threaten public safety, as in The Guardian today. Probation trusts are accountable, integrated with private and voluntary providers, locally sensitive and comprehensive. Bottom-up initiatives could, of course, be extended why have separate mutuals? Why not have employer, employee-led engagement within probation trusts? Co-production with service users has developed a lot in recent years. Innovation is there, and flexibility is there. Probation is an organisation which passes the test of being an institution. In the last few minutes, I want to, though, go on and assume that the worst-case scenario will occur. I hope that it won't on the basis of what I've discussed. But I want to do some brief thinking about the future contracting in England and Wales. At the moment, as far as I can determine this, there will be three tiers of operation. Tiers is a good word here. <laughs> there will be prime contractors in 21 areas, or chunks, shall we call them, which actually will take 88% of the work it's talked about 70-30, but when you add 50,000 people being supervised under new under 12-month orders, it's 88%. And they will be a lead provider, possibly a consortium, even less likely, but possibly a mutual or a partnership. Tier 2 will compose the National Probation Service, the rump of public, protection, uh, public probation, 12% of the work. We're responsible for reports, risk assessment, risk management, of high-risk cases. At some point in the near future, there will be a little bit about the, the, the parting of the waves, when the 12% will go one way into the National Probation Service and the rest will go into these or limited life organisations which are currently either being called GUFCOs or NUCOs. This is the majority of the probation staff in each area will form themselves into a temporary organisation called a NUCO, and they'll be within these 21 areas, so it'll mean probation staff joining from different trusts. And they will be protected and then bought for a pound by the provider that wins the contract. They will be their staff resource when it comes to starting the new work. 
More of that in a minute. The third tier are potential mutuals who might be brought in to do parts of the work. Voluntary sector partners and small subcontracts of voluntary sector organisations locally. And possibly a probation institute. So, can we stop the death knell sounding? I think there are four strands in the, uh, straws in the wind. The new National Probation Service, Mutuals, Mucos, and the Probation Institute. A few remarks on each, and then I will finish. The new National Probation Service. <coughs> the size will be small, and their reach will be extremely limited, though they will have high-level responsibilities. But when you know the numbers of people that will be involved in the MPS in any region, you realise how challenging their job will be. There will be a lack of local presence. There's no chance that they will be able to maintain the integration and partnerships that they've hitherto been involved in. There simply won't be enough of them. There will also be civil servants, and therefore effectively suffer the corporate silencing we've already seen in the last few months and therefore will hardly be able to talk about the problems that has occurred. They also, because they're so small, will have no substantive infrastructure to resurrect probation in the event of these proposals being disastrous. How will they provide leadership? There will be one national figure and six local areas. We have a successful history of national leadership uh, in NOMS. I don't see how that will change particularly now. So, in terms of the future of probation, they're an uncertain home for the institution of probation. They have lack of cultural and practice independence. The mutuals. Mutuals are being proposed as somehow the way forward for probation. I think they're there because uh, Grayling can't quite convincingly tell us why probation trusts can't apply for these contracts in the first place. So they'll say, well, of course you can, but you have to do so in the form of a mutual. Feasibility. Have mutuals the time to set up and imp implement? Stability. These mutuals will have a single customer. Is that a good basis uh, for stability? Timing. The mutuals are vulnerable because they'll be new, they'll have no track record, and they would need time to embed. They won't have time to embed because they'll be required to be part of the process within the next six to eight months. Risk. Mutuals could go bust in a competitive environment. The private contractors may not need them. There are risks to jobs and continuity of provision. Desirability. Why would private contractors wish to contract with mutuals and take on the risks, pensions, redundancy, servicing, HR functions, when NUCOs would be an easier bet to do this. I think there is a possibility of specialist mutuals, small-scale mutuals delivering specialist services, for instance, say, around accredited programmes. But this is a very small scale. They become part of Tier 3, uh, buying in some services which can't be provided elsewhere. If there's a good accredited programme team, there's no reason why it can't become peripatetic and service accredited programmes in a wider area. That's a real possibility, I think, for mutuals, but it's very small scale. It's not part of the central system. So, in my view, mutuals are unlikely to be a major provider, will be preoccupied with their own survival and almost inevitably small scale. Newcos. This is the new kid on the block. And it's only just becoming clear how this is going to develop. Newcos will maintain the professional role intact through the transfer process. And they'll be a key role for who's the appointed leader in transition, because each Newco will need some kind of equivalent to a chief executive. Who will win the 21 package areas? We've assumed all along, all the arguments in the papers have been this is going to be further uh, private for profit justice sector providers such as Serco, G4S, and Sodexo. And all the anger has been poured into those. 
I'm not sure that's correct. The evidence suggests that the people who are most likely to win out are not those providers, but private business process outsourcing agency, such as Capita, Unilink, Tribal, Mushell, Interserve, Centrion, Campbell Page, Steria, Carrion, Le and so on. There are loads of them. They're all attending the market. They're very different to private sector justice organisations because they don't have any understanding of criminal justice business. They can't come in and deliver probation as Serco and G4S might want to do as they've done when they've delivered in prisons and elsewhere. This means that they will rely absolutely because they do not know the business of probation, they'll need probation expertise. What they're good at is back office functions. They will go. The staff in uh, sports staff will disappear. They'll be cut during the first phase. But those that remain will deliver statutory orders, the A's with the MPS, and they'll be protected by MOJ, both pensions protection, but MOJ will keep the capacity to step back in and bring them back under control. This is a likely site of probation expertise in the big business of delivering 250,000 statutory orders. But of course, no institutional identity. 21 new codes swallowed up possibly in 21 different ways by the private uh, providers. So I come to my final point. And where do one, if you're going to keep the institution of probation, where do you maintain ownership, governance, accountability, and cultural continuity? The only place you, I can see this is in some form of probation institute, which inter interestingly has appeared in the transforming rehabilitation agenda throughout. As it says in the quote, if ownership of public services is distributed among a constellation of mutuals, co-ops, private sector companies, VCS, and a residual public sector, where does responsibility lie for the maintenance and quality of those services? Contracting is a threadbare model of accountability. Quality assurance is threatened. This is all that's in this risk register here. The development of a statutory probation register will not happen. Grayling has already said so in the short term. But voluntary register is a key way to buy in new providers to a recognisable kite mark. Given that they will be picking up for a pound the new codes who will already have relevant qualifications, voluntary registration would be a way of getting that a little bit extra in their bid preparation. The loosening of national standards, which has been going on for a year or two, might be seen as advantageous in normal respects for offender-centred practices. But without regulation, it eases the way for private providers simply to do it their own way. Why have a probation institute? Is the name probation a problem uh, in the future? I actually think it's the brand. I hope I've demonstrated that what probation has brought for over 105 years is something that is meaningful, something that people understand. In all the work we do, all the research work we do with service users, when asked, they always talk about being on probation, despite the fact that probation orders haven't existed for some seven or more years. They understand probation still, probably more so than, uh, than we give them credit for. I think by keeping the probation brand, you preserve the institution of probation. The key elements, just very briefly, they will be independent and inclusive, open to all criminal justice agencies, a professional register setting competence levels. They would maintain professional standards and quality assurance. The repository of good practice, enabling dissemination, no commercial incompetence. One of my worries about 21 contract providers is when they hit on a good thing, when they do well in payment by results, will they share those results with other areas? Or will they keep them so they can bid to win the other area in the next round of bidding? We need evidence-informed research to continue to mark out quality practice. Training education, building on the consistency <coughs> developed in the PQF and its predecessor, the DIPS. To get into post-qualifying, which has been sadly neglected in recent years. The future of probation possibly lies in a probation institute, a constructively critical cultural repository for probation. So I've talked about the death 
of the rehabilitative ideal from 1975 to the death knell of probation service in 2013. I'm not sure we're there yet. No one can quite see in the crystal ball of Chris Grayling. Is it a crystal ball or is it a political football? Time will tell. But I think there's still enough straws in the wind to give us hope that the Institute of Probation has some time to go yet. Thank you.